Our thanks to Calvin as you bring to us our first reading. Today's reading is taken from John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. That is, John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Jesus heals a man born blind. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who, asked, who had been asked to born blind. His disciples asked him, Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents? Jesus answered, His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is day, we must keep on doing the work of him who sent him. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light for the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes and said, Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means sent. So the man went, washed his face, and came back seeing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Thanks to Noah for the second reading. Today's reading is taken from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. This can be found on page 312 on the back portion of the Bible. That is Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. The message to Sardis, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? This is the message from the one who had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know what you are doing. I know that you have the reputation of being alive, even though you are dead. So wake up and strengthen what you still have before it dies completely. For I find that what you have done is not yet perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you were taught and what you heard. Obey it and turn from your sins. If you do not wake up, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not even know the time when I will come. But a few of you there in Sardis have kept your clothes clean. You will walk with me, clothed in white, because you are worthy to do so. Those who win the victory will be clothed like this in white, and I will not remove their names from the book of living. In the present in the presence of my father and of his angels, I will declare openly that they belong to me. If you have the ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And please turn with me on your Bible app or in your Bibles and hope as well as here to Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, as we are at the Studying the sixth of the seven churches. Well, the fifth of the seven churches. Let's pray to you. Lord God, the big command in the book of Revelation is behold, see, behold what God is doing. Behold God. And Lord God, we would see Jesus we pray. Amen. The citadel, the fortress of Sardis, was high on a precipice in the mountainous region, and the prophets had said it would never be captured. The wealth of Sardis was famous. It is said that the river ran with gold, I guess the panning the gold, perhaps where the, the wealth began. And their greatest king was Croesus, from which we have the proverb, as rich as Croesus. And he was said to be the first king anywhere to mint coins in gold and silver. But under Croesus, they plunged to disaster. He had been warned. A wise Greek statesman visited and was shown all the 
magnificent to luxury, but he also saw the blind self-confidence that nothing could end this, and he saw the seeds of softness and degeneration being sown, and he said his famous words to Croesus, call no man happy until he is dead. Croesus began a war with Cyrus of Persia. Cyrus we meet in Isaiah in the Old Testament. And this was the end of Sardis, or their greatness. To get at the armies of Cyrus, he had to cross the river Halys. And he took counsel at the famous oracle at Delphi and was told, if you cross the river Halys, you will destroy a great empire. Croesus took it as a promise that he would annihilate the Persians. It never crossed his mind that it was a warning to him. He crossed the Halys, fought, and was routed. But he was not in the least bit worried. Am I bothered? He thought all he had to do was to retire to Sardis because they had their impregnable fortress there. And so it was that Cyrus began the siege of Sardis. And Cyrus, the emperor, offered a special reward to anyone who could find a way into the city. Well, Sardis citadel may have been high up, but the rock was very clay-like, and it developed cracks. <coughs> and a soldier, soldier saw a, a, a soldier from Sardis accidentally drop his helmet over the battlements. Whereupon this soldier climbed down the rock face, got his helmet, and climbed back up again. And the soldier thought to himself, ah, well, if he can do it, so could we. And word was got to Cyrus, and Cyrus sent his troops up the precipice that night. They found a big crack in the rock up which they could climb. They climbed up, they reached the top, and they found the citadel completely unguarded on the battlements. The city fell. <clears throat> the message from Christ to the church of Sardis, who knew their history. I know you have the reputation of being alive, even though you are dead. So wake up and strengthen what you still have before it dies completely. For I find that what you have done is not yet perfect in the sight of my God. Sardis knew the danger of being asleep. They knew the danger of being off your guard. Their city fell because they were not alert. Church, wake up! Wake up at home if you're falling asleep. You are under attack. You may have a great reputation. You may be known for all sorts of things, but you are dying. Christian, you may have a great testimony of what God has done in your life, but that was last week, last year, last decade. You've been dining out on it since, but you are virtually dead. You come to church, but what else is there? Wake up, take nothing for granted. Christian, awake, there are decisions needed, matters to attend to, face up to them, do not let things drift, wake up. They thought they were an impregnable citadel, but they weren't. My soul, your soul, is not an impregnable citadel. There is a spiritual battle in my soul, in your soul, right now. Now, Martin, wake up! Your name. Wake up! You may have heard of the great battle that is said to be at the end of the world, at Armageddon. Sometimes it's referred to by politicians or by movies and the like. And Armageddon simply means the Mount of Megiddo. And you'll find a reference to it in chapter 16 of Revelation. I think this is in fact a poetic reference to that battle in your soul that is going on now. Because every moment in our lives determines the future course of our lives and determines our future in eternity. There is a battle 
going on. And the clue to this about Megiddo is that Mount Megiddo is an invented mountain, but it is near a valley, the valley of Megiddo, which was known for its spiritual values. And I think that what John in writing the vision in being written is doing is taking the battle that was at Sardis on the mountain there, but then shifting it to another place, also known, an area known for battles, known for spiritual battles, if you read the Old Testament, and saying that battle that was there at Sardis and was lost, this is the battle for us all. Martin, wake up! We know the second law of thermodynamics. In the universe, entropy increases, or to put it another way, energy always decreases. The clock is always running down. It needs winding. The car needs recharging, and you can't find a place to plug it in. We need to sit, rest, sleep, and in general things fall apart, decay, run down. Unless energy is put in, all will stop. And that is a law for our souls as well. Our tendency is towards entropy, laziness, weariness, indolence, disinterested, powerlessness. Am I bothered? These things are not good. You are, we are princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. God, in Genesis we read, gave us authority to rule over the things of this world. And we need to wake up to pay attention. Left to ourselves, our souls never move closer to God, never move deeper, deeper into life. Always the other way. We are fish swimming against the tide of society. It takes effort, and if we do not apply ourselves to that effort, we will be like Sardis. So we must be at the battlements, ready for the unexpected attack. There is a spiritual battle for the citadel of your soul. So then, what were the signs of decay for Sardis? What are the signs of decay in our life individually and as a church? What may that be? And there were two particular things for Sardis that are attended to. First of all, things were left unfinished. There's reference there to completing, finishing, perfecting the work. Now, there was a great temple in Sardis, a temple to the Greek god Artemis, who we read of elsewhere in Acts, and was at Ephesus, not far away, and there was a temple in Sardis, a wonderful, magnificent temple it was going to be. It was famously unfinished. So this temple where the god uh, was to be worshipped, was unfinished. And so Christ is saying to this church, you are unfinished. You're not seeing things through. And an unfinished work is a worthless work. Do I, do you, see things through that we have committed to? Do I, do you, persevere? Do we wrestle with problems as against, as against giving up the first sign of <clears throat> Do we take responsibility? If we cannot make a meeting, do we set the problems? Things and people depend on you and me. My training vicar started in the church group. And one day it snowed. There was just him and one other who turned up. What shall we do? asked the other. We carry on, the vicar replied. We carry on. But Sardis did not. They gave up when it was difficult. So what significant thing have you, have I, left unfinished? Or do we put off because it is too hard? The second sign of decay for the church of Sardis was that they had a good reputation. In fact, we don't read of any opposition here at all. The other six letters are full of stuff. There wasn't any heresy, and actually heresy, wrong teaching, is, is to some extent a sign of life. It means there's something to oppose, but there was nothing to oppose him. Everyone liked them. 
So perhaps the words of Jesus in Luke 6 are relevant. Luke 6, verse 26, when Jesus says, Beware when all speak well of you. They all spoke well of Sardis, the church there. But they did not speak well of Christ. Yes, let us, it is good to have good reputations as long as it is based on good reasons for our Christ lives. But Christ was not afraid to be unpopular even to death. And are there times when you or I are too nice, when we are too worried about what people or someone will think, so that we avoid doing what is needed to be done or to be said? And Silas did not see things through, and they were worried about what people thought. They had a good reputation, and they didn't want this meant death to the church. So what are the signs of decay in your soul, in my soul? What sort of angel, which means a messenger from God, what sort of angel are we at St. Paul's in Holland? What sort of angel are you at work to pick up the sort of language with which the let, each of the letters begin? So there is the citadel of your soul. There are the signs of decay that we will all know because we are all swimming against the tide. But there is then the spirit promised. Entropy means everything runs down. We are resurrection people. We are not far out of celebrating Easter together. There was a famous graveyard in Sardis. Famous people were buried there and maybe they had a book of the dead. But Jesus says to them, I want to keep you in the book of life. They used to debate things of resurrection and death at Sardis. It was one of the issues. But Jesus says, I want to give you new life to be in the book of life. And in this letter to the church, in verse 1, of which we read, we hear that Christ is the one who has the seven spirits of God. In other words, Christ is amongst us now as he was amongst us then. Christ is next to you now as he was next to them then. Christ is next to you at your home when you get there. Christ is next to you when you're out in the precincts here. Christ is next to you at work with the seven spirits of God, which simply means the completeness of God. Seven in the Bible means everything there is of it. Completeness, fullness of it. You may be incomplete. Church of Sardis, Martin, St. Paul's, whoever we are. You may be incomplete, like that unbuilt temple, but Christ is complete. You may only have one of the seven, as it were, but Christ is next to you and says, let me give you the rest. The Spirit is there for you, all that you need for your spiritual awakening and renewal. And Christ has got all things to give you. Christ, we read in this story, is the one who holds the seven stars, picking up the language of the coinage of the day where the son of the emperor Domitian holds seven stars in his hands. And Christ is the one who holds the seven stars. In other words, it's not the Roman Empire, it's not Westminster, it's not your boss that is the control of everything. It is Christ who holds all things in Christ's hand. And God wants them to know he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole wide world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands he's got the whole world in his hands and the whole world in our gospel reading jesus gave sight to the blind but Maybe John, in writing the book of Revelation, either anticipated or remembered what he wrote, and I think anticipated personally, um, because the word in John is see, behold, all the rest of it. And in John's Gospel, we have this story of John of the, heal of the healing of the blind man. And this is a key one in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is the one who gives sight that we may be able to see. And Christ gives the gift of spiritual sight. Christ, in the same way that Christ gave the gift of physical sight to this blind man who had been blind from birth, we are blind, but Christ offers us, offers you sight. 
all is not lost. We are offered that sight from God. Those who win the victory, we read in verse 5, will be clothed like this in white. And I will not remove their names from the book of the living. In the presence of my Father and his angels, I will declare openly that they belong to me. Nice little things there about reputation as well, just on the way of declaring openly. At Sardis, they were leaders in the art of dyeing wool. Sardis was the centre of the woolen trade. As though Christ says to the people at Sardis, Christ, I can take the blackest of souls and make it pure white. To pick up another image, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And you shall wear white robes. White robes are associated with festivals and celebrations and coronations and all these sorts of things. As though Christ is saying, you may be in a mess now, but by the gift of my spirit, by the gift of life, I am there to give you life, the fullness of the spirit, to bring you light, so that you may see the prophet, may see Christ first of all, and may respond. As Paul puts it in Ephesians, written to the letter from not far away, and the letter that they were probably familiar with, I guess, the silence, the same region. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Where is Christ speaking you to you today? In what way do you need to wake up? In what way do I need to wake up? To man, to woman, the battlements. Christ is with you ready to pour out Christ's Spirit on you, the sevenfold of the Spirit, to give you sight, to bring you new life, to wash you, to change you. Christ will not deny you. We do not want to.